it's important to get on podcasts of people that are truly trying to find out what's the right answer. This is the most valuable place to be because the people that are listening to this podcast, they just want to know the right answer, right? That's why I always try and go out and find who's going to ask me the toughest question because that's where we will actually get things done. a parking lot with a pink hotel a boutique and a swinging hot spot don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got till it's gone hello and welcome to trolling with logic for november 27 2016 i am your host nathan dickey Cal Kitch and Jen are joining me today. Julia was not unfortunately unable to make it for this particular episode, but today's show is a very special one because we have with us two guests who have both individually been on the show before, and now they're coming back together to help us talk about today's topic, which is eco-modernism. Before I introduce these two guests, I need to mention that the Trolling with Logic podcast now has a Patreon page set up. If you like this show and would like to help support it, please consider heading over to patreon.com slash trollingwithlogic and making a pledge of $5 or more per episode. We always take pride in providing content that makes you, the listener, think and doing so in a fun and irreverent manner. A pledge of $5 or more will get you early access to the edited, polished version of the show before everyone else, and your name will be read out at the end of every episode as a big thing. Thank you for supporting the team. And uh, this is something that will be especially appreciated by Cal, who, as the founder of Trolling with Logic, really continues to be the life force of the show. And he plans most of our topics and all that. And with that out of the way, I'll now introduce our two special guests. First, we have Vance Crow with us. Vance is the director of Millennial Engagement at Monsanto. A large part of his job is engaging with the general public about what Monsanto is all about and learning from farmers especially how Monsanto could best serve their interests. He's been a strong proponent of GM and other aspects of modern biotechnology, especially as it relates to agricultural developments, and he's one of the most eloquent and clear speakers I know when it comes to tackling the problem of just how to explain these things in an understandable and relatable way to the public. Welcome to the show, Vance. Or welcome Thanks, back, Nathan. I should, I should hang out with you more often. <laughs> that was a nice introduction. <laughs> and I'm also right, Vance, in uh, remembering that uh, there was a recent newspaper article which they said you were what, the hunky director of millennial. <laughs> you're the hunkiest director of millennial engagement around. Yeah, it's easy when you're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and our other guest today is Rowley Partinen. He is one of the co-founders of the Eco-Modernist Society of Finland, where he serves as their energy analyst and vice chair of the board. He is also one of the authors of the book, Climate Gamble, is Anti-Nuclear Activism Endangering Our Future, and also one of three authors of the book, The World After Cheap Oil. Welcome back to the show, Rowley. Uh, thank you. I'm really glad to be here. And just to add to Rowley, uh, Rowley still holds the record as being the most downloaded show we've ever done, the most popular one. Oh, right. <laughs> You've beaten the man from Monsanto. That's not going to go down well. <laughs> yeah, but he's better looking than I am. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about eco-modernism today, as I mentioned, and that's a word that maybe a lot of people have not heard. Maybe some of them have heard only in the past year or so as a new word that's coming into more common usage in some parts of the blogosphere and other parts of the internet. What are we talking about when we're talking about eco-modernism? Some key words that I see that keep coming up is the Anthropocene, which is a phrase that has been coined to mean the age of humans, and also words like modernization, which the eco-modernists are using in a slightly different way than is currently being mostly used. Uh, does anybody want to, to start out very generally and then narrow down to some very specific details about it? How would you describe eco-modernism in a few short sentences? Okay, uh, for me personally, or yeah, I, I recognize both of those that you you mentioned, but for me, it, what is important is that we aim to be evidence-based, so look for solutions that actually work. 
and look for scientific proof, statistical proof, and shortly evidence of stuff that works. A friend of mine actually has coined this term that uh, ecomodernism is, is, uh, has messy solutions for messy problems. So it's not always ideologically pure or beautiful, but we need to make it work. So that evidence is for me and uh, mainstream science are the, the key drivers because I don't want to do environmentalism that I don't know if it's going to do any good. I want proof. I think uh, from my perspective, the first time I heard about eco-modernism was in, I think, April of 2015 when the Breakthrough Institute uh, brought together a whole bunch of scholars and journalists and environmentalists to say, the old way of thinking about environmentalism, the one that we helped pioneer, is not actually bringing us forward. It's not preserving more of the environment. In fact, it's become more of a regressive movement. It's to take away technology. It's to try and say that humans are somehow breaking the relationship that they've always had with nature. And so they published a document called the Eco-Modernist Manifesto, which is about 30 pages, and it outlined all of these ways that you could think about environmentalism that maybe weren't intuitive because the last 30 or so years of environmentalism have really been about humans are bad. Anytime they interact with the environment, anytime they do a little bit to try and move human beings forward, that comes at the cost of the environment and that we are somehow leaving an age where things were better and moving to a place where things are worse. And uh, eco-modernism is much more about, wait a second, maybe we are figuring out ways to preserve as much of the environment as possible by using things like science and technology to intensify the areas where we need to use the environment so that that way we can preserve uh, as much of the untouched or wild environment as possible. It's about decoupling human activity and human impact from nature. That's another uh, aspect of it that I hear a lot is the word decoupling, which is emphasized a lot. And especially now with a uh, human population globally coming to a peak and expected to level off in the next 50 years after the peak that we're currently in, it's not feasible anymore to kind of embrace this back to nature hunter gatherer mindset. Human populations were small and scarce uh, back in those days when the impact on the land was small because of our small population size. And now we need to find a way to become independent of nature using science and technology. Yeah, I would have to agree on that and, and on Vance's answer as well. Completely agree on, on both of those. Decoupling, it's proven to be very hard at uh, especially if you want to have absolute decoupling instead of just relatively doing kind of more, but not with less, but with the same amount of damage. But that's actually for me why, for example, the Finnish Economist Society, when we found it, we thought about our founding text and we decided to have that we are neutral about solutions, not about technologies. So we also think about social chains and stuff like that, that can have an effect but we don't expect any of those to work miracles. So in that sense, I've also said that eco-modernism is the most pessimistic environmental movement because it doesn't believe in any silver bullets out there. We just have everything that we have and look at the evidence, what works and what doesn't. Yeah, it is kind of the old thing that the, the best solutions are always the most counterintuitive ones, which is what I get a lot with eco-modernism. And when I support nuclear power and GM crops, there's always, you know, from the the mainstream and by like the green movements and that, there's always a backlash towards me. They just <coughs> shake their head to say, no, you can't be an environmentalist if you believe in those things. What I really liked about eco-modernism was it was the first time that it was environmentalism that didn't rely on me thinking that the world needed saving, that the, that everything was going wrong and that humans were always bad whenever they came in contact with nature or the earth. And so for me, eco-modernism was one of the first times I'd ever experienced and embraced the idea of environmentalism as a, hey, the world is getting better. We don't have to be in this place of um, apocalyptic uh, visions of the future. And that's why we have to stop uh, advancing human beings. So I, I, I kind of naturally gravitate towards it for its optimism, although all no neutrality or even pessimism about w which type of technology is almost irrelevant. They just want to figure out what's the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also think that it's also the most optimistic about of the <laughs> environmental movements. And that that's one thing that drew me there. 
it's also a counterintuitive idea that's basically it is also the most pessimistic because it doesn't believe that solar panels and windmills are going to do the trick. It demands more proof and it demands that we use all the technologies that we have and all the solutions that we have to, for example, fight uh, off climate change. What are the newest kind of technologies that people might not have heard of that you are investigating and, and thinking about putting forward in, in these sorts of circles? Our society called out three top priorities last year for us to look into it. And uh, some stuff had to do with bioeconomy that is big here in Finland. We we need to save the environment from the bioenergy and bioeconomy boom. But on this question, I tell that we try to inform society about advanced nuclear nuclear reactors that are often in, in fundamental ways different than the current fleet, which is also awesome. But uh, the new designs can help maybe people to look at nuclear power in a, in a new, light, new light and uh, find new applications for it, for example, to make industrial heat, process heat or, or maybe liquid fuels synthetically. That's a big problem, isn't it? Because a lot of people that I've spoken to since um, since knowing that you guys would be on the show, they're very sceptical about nuclear power and very worried as well because of the, the long-term storage problems. Um, and I understand there's been various different bits of research into how to store it effectively and how to stop the... Um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we had we had this thing called PubHD that we do every now and again. Uh, and there was one lad who came in who was talking about how they were trying to work out what kind of microbes they could use in the layers around the concrete shell of of underground storage for waste nuclear fuel rods, etc. So there's a lot of there's a lot of suspicion, there's a lot of uh, fear around nuclear power. How do you combat that best? You you guys need to do a show on nuclear waste, and I will be here for the third, third okay, time. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's really a bucket of worms when you open it. But the for example, the, the one of the main reasons. For people being afraid of nuclear waste or spent nuclear fuel is that including the industry but also everybody else think that it will be dangerous forever but the standard of how dangerous is ridiculously low for nuclear waste for example in sweden i talked uh, about this with a friend of mine the other day and there when you they are also quite far in their final repository project not as far as we in finland but quite far and they're the standard for someone living atop the repository. The the extra radiation dose that he or she will get is equal, the maximum, I mean, is equal to the dose you get by sleeping next to a, another person. So I think that's, if you have that kind of standards and you call everything above sleeping next to another person radiation dose-wise dangerous, then, I mean... It makes no sense. We should have a reasonable comparisons on, on what is dangerous and what is not. Because if you can get a bucket of gasoline from the next gasoline station, that's pretty much more dangerous than what the nuclear waste will be in, for example, 1,000 years. But yeah, about the question, how you tell this to people. Yeah, I've been, mm. <laughs> it's all right. I've been thinking and writing and uh, examples like this, sleeping next to another person or mm. eating a bunch of bananas per year. That's the radiation dose that you can maximally get from the waste when you stuff it in a hole that's several hundred mm. meters deep underground. And and actually, the industry is not doing a favor by telling us that, OK, it's not so dangerous, but we still need to dig a hole that half a mile yeah. deep and stuck it there with multiple layers of copper and cement and whatever. No, they're making people afraid. There's the whole Fukushima thing as well, though, isn't there, that um, a lot of people see any kind of disaster involving nuclear as potentially a world-altering disaster. Uh, they talk about the fish stocks being damaged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems to, in their mind at least, when I speak to them, go against the whole eco-modernist kind of thing, because there's this extra pollutant that can cause all this damage potentially and cause mutations in the fish and get into the food chain. And so they're they're terrified of that. So when you say, well, nuclear power is potentially the way forward, they go, you, you must be a bit mental. There's windmills over there that do a better job. That's what they tell me. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to try to change people's mind by pouring facts on them. Mm. Of course, sometimes you need to you, you need to show the evidence. You need to show the facts. You need to show that, for example, the, the radiation dose that the Pacific Ocean received from Fukushima is tiny compared to the radiation dose that it already has. 
mm. made naturally from uranium and, and cesium and stuff like that. I think your example that you already gave was a really good one. I hadn't even heard the one about, you know, sleeping next to somebody and how much radiation. I think that fear is such an easy way to package information so that people pay attention to it, right? The reason that we are all living here is because our ancestors paid attention to things that they should be afraid of. So as memes are spreading, the ones that are either fear or disgust or um, potential danger, like you were talking about Fukushima, it's so much harder to have a message spread that is about, hey, this is the value of it, because you have to understand, in order to understand the value of something like nuclear, you have to understand many things, the economics, the demand for energy, you have to understand how energy moves from one place to another. I mean, it's just so complicated. So finding those small examples that allow people to grab onto and be able to share it with somebody else. Because it's one thing to be able to tell somebody why uh, you believe in something, but the stronger thing is not only for you to be able to tell one person, but that that person can tell somebody else. And so the example that you were using before about laying next to a person, or I've heard about how many bananas you would have to eat in order to have a, a dosage. I mean, those types of things, while to people that are really deeply knowledgeable about a subject seem kind of pedantic or seem kind of you know, I, I roll worthy are actually really important in order for people that are never going to take the time or have the the exposure to um, information to be able to make real decisions. They just need to have things that they can grab onto memes that that help them understand the way the world works. Meme the shit out of it. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I was going to say, uh, I think Vance, you're kind of in the more difficult place of kind of, you know, you're coming from the GM angle because you know, like we said, with mainstream environment, they want to go back and expect that's easier to do with um, agriculture than it is with energy because you can't really take energy tech back. But people seem to be more inclined to do that with the farming tech. How do you convince folk that, you know, the new ways of farming are better than what we used to do? You know, I think that that is something that I certainly don't have all, all the answers to or even a majority of the answers. But the things that I've learned about communicating things that people are afraid of is really about first listening to what their fears are um, and asking them to give you the, the to run the whole distance about things. So and what I mean by that is research shows that if somebody has a strong feeling about something, if you ask them to explain it, not just what is your fear, but tell me how this works. How do you believe that this technology works and tell me about the intervening steps, not even waiting to try and poke them and say, no, that's where you're wrong. Just the fact that you ask people to explain in depth uh, what they believe that they know, and then when they when it exposes that there are certain leaps that they don't understand or don't know exactly how things work, makes them much more open to then turning to you as an expert or turning to you as somebody that maybe knows a little bit more. And when you fill in those gaps for them, it really does have a pretty strong change in the way that they feel about things. So, for example, in something like GM technology, right? So oftentimes people will say, uh, well, Monsanto created a genetically engineered crop so that it could increase the amount of sales that it made for glyphosate. So when you made Roundup Ready crops, now you're able to sell both the Roundup Ready seeds and the, and the herbicide. So if that's all that somebody knows, then they maybe feel a little odd about that, or they, they don't, but they don't see that there's any value to these crops. So one of the things that I often talk about is all the way back to some of the first societies that ever did agriculture, all the way back, even before the Egyptians, the way that you did weed control was that you took some sort of a spike into the ground and you ripped the ground open so that you could tear weeds apart. And then those weeds, all those rootstocks, couldn't grow as effectively the next year, plowing or tilling the ground. One of the things most people don't realize, when you do that, Every time all of the carbon that had been sequestered in that soil because of the, the plants that were there, the soil is ripped open and that carbon flies up in the air. So since the very advent of agriculture over the last 10,000 years, we've been throwing carbon in the air every time we go to plow or till that. Well, now with GM crops, something like Roundup, you can go through and spray all the weeds and that they die and that it is a very low toxicity herbicide. And you don't have to throw carbon up in the air by tilling or plowing. You have this no-till agriculture. And suddenly this is like a, a wave over people. They really know that we need to limit how much carbon we emit into the environment. And that because we now have this new technology, 
we're able to limit how much carbon we're throwing in the air through agriculture. Suddenly you've given something to somebody that they can grab onto, and now they have a reason for at least giving GMOs the benefit of the doubt or being open to more of them. I was going to say there, um, just that I didn't know that uh, CO2, when that's released, that's released through plowing. And it brought into my head there that in Ireland every summer, in Tullamore, there's this thing called the National Plowing Championships, which is a huge event every year. So <laughs> that's got to be something to bring up. I'm going to have, I'm going to be very popular there next year. <laughs> Plowing and tilling all has its place. I don't want to. I don't want to say that you know there's only one way to do it and it's no till. But it's definitely an aspect of farming that most people don't realize. I certainly didn't, and I think that's one of the advantages that I came into this space of eco modernism. That somebody that has deep knowledge, like you, Raúl, you have a deep knowledge. For me, every time I learn something about agriculture. I'm fascinated because I'm just as far away from it as most consumers. And so I can often be like, hey, that's the interesting thing I didn't know anything about, like plows release carbon into the environment. And I think that that's one of the troubles that you have about complicated ideas like nuclear, like GMOs, is that the more expertise you have, you have this kind of curse of knowledge, which makes it really hard to know what will the public find interesting. Oh, yeah. The curse of knowledge is a curse. <laughs> <laughs> I did have another question um, to you, Vance, because it's one that I've been asked quite a few times. Um, and it was brought up in a film that a lot of people I know have seen called The World According to Monsanto. And it's this idea, everybody says, well, all Monsanto is really after is just money. And you touched on that beforehand. And they talk about this entire thing of ownership of the seeds and the fact that the farmers aren't allowed to reuse the seeds that, and they have to give them back. And I've tried to explain, although perhaps not particularly well, that if if you have a product, if you have a, a seed that is a product, and that is still going through various different improvements, potentially, within the factory, etc., that can play into needing to take those seeds back and potentially give a new type of seed. If there's been a, on a study, for example, there's been a, a type of crop um, improvement for the next season. But what, what kind of responses have you given to questioning on that kind of front in the past? So... One of the first things that most people don't realize about farming, at least in modern ag, is that if you want to reuse your seeds, you can't do it with hybrid crops. So corn that's hybridized, which we've been doing since the early 1900s, you can't replant them. It's like trying to breed two labradoodles together and expecting there to be a better labradoodle coming out, but it wouldn't be. But when you talk about crops like soybeans or cotton, one of the reasons that farmers haven't traditionally reused those seeds is it's actually really complicated, specialized thing to be able to harvest seeds, clean them, have them have a high enough germination rate that when you put them in the ground, you're assured that you're going to have crops that grow. So for many years, all the way back since the 1920s or 30s, farmers have specialized. Some of them grow seeds to resell and some of them grow for commodities to put it into the market. But when you talk about things like one of the things that the world, according to Monsanto, often mentions is these lawsuits that have occurred over patents. And I think that I also struggled with this when I came into the company and and I sat down with this old grain trader. Uh, I don't mean to call him old, but this this mm -hmm. old older guy, I really like him. His name is Jim Tobin. He's a really interesting guy. And we were talking about where did this idea <laughs> of suing farmers come from? And he said, well, it comes from when we initially came out with BT cotton, it was the first time that we were going to be able to have a, a cotton plant that would produce a protein that made it so insects couldn't eat it and you wouldn't have to go out and spray as much herbicide. Well, that cost us hundreds of millions of dollars to develop. But then once we had developed it, we then had to put it through the regulatory environment. And now, right now, if you want to get a crop through the regulatory environment, it costs about $10 million a year. And it's about 13 years. So it's $130 million. So when we initially came to those cotton farmers and we said, hey, we've got a technology that you guys want, seeds with this BT in it, unfortunately, this is going to be the most expensive bag of seeds ever produced because we need to recoup all of our R&D for the future. And the cotton farmers were like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want to pay for all of the R&D that you've ever done on this. That, that's going to make them too expensive. Can we come up with another arrangement? And so we, with the cotton farmers, came up with a system where we made an agreement that we would not raise the price too much year in and year out, but that they wouldn't have to pay for all of that R&D in one year, right? They could pay for it by buying new seeds every year. And the cotton farmers were like, we agree to this, so that way the price of a bag of seeds isn't as high. But here's the thing. 
if I sign something agreeing that I won't replant these seeds, then if my neighbor replants his seeds, then he has a major advantage over me. So you have to agree that if I'm going to follow the rules, you have to make sure all the other farmers follow the rules. And so therefore, we made an agreement saying that if a farmer uh, reused the seeds after they had signed an agreement saying they wouldn't, that we would sue them. And that is something that the perception by movies like that is that we're doing it all the time. But in the years since we've had biotechnology, we've had just uh, about 54 lawsuits only 12 of them have ever gone to trial, and only four of those have ever actually been all the way adjudicated by a judge, all of which were put in our favor because somebody signed an agreement saying they wouldn't resell them, and they did. But we hate suing farmers because anytime you sue a farmer, you're never going to get that client back. So oftentimes when you have the time, like you do on a long-form podcast like this to explain it, people seem to say, okay, I get that. But we often are trying to battle against a clip somebody saw in a documentary they were half watching, yeah. you know? Yeah, uh, just to get back to, I'm just reading some of the criticisms online of eco-modernism. And how do you respond to, well, it's the main one on Wikipedia where they say uh, say that you're just, it's uh, an excuse to continue the exploitation of natural resources for our own gains. Uh, how would you respond to that, Riley? Shortly or long? Uh, go for long, <laughs> yeah, we've got plenty of time. Uh, uh, I would say that it's a straw man argument. That's a short one. <laughs> And here comes the not long one. eco is, 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 at least in Finland, how we see it, is environmentalism for everybody. Also, the people who have not been into environmentalism before, because they have not liked some of the stuff that the traditional movement is, is, has been doing. So, of course, you get plenty of different people. And, of course, some of them will say stuff that will give you that idea. And then there is another guy who will say something else. So it's easy to pick one article or one writing and uh, maybe read it only partly in a certain way and then build a nice straw man and then and then go about destroying that. And that's pretty much what's what's happening there. But I can see the reasoning actually with what Vance said before that we try to see things that everything is not going to hell, not the ap- apocalypse. There is a lot of positive trends that we need to enforce. But for example, me, I, I have never said that we should continue as as is. That's a horrible idea because a lot of trends are going in a very bad way as well. We need to fix that. But we cannot fix that, at least according to the evidence that I have seen. We cannot fix that by stopping everything and trying to kind of steer the boat into the other direction because there's 7 billion people here. We cannot don't have any mechanisms for controlling all those people. They will do what they want. All we can do is maybe try to get some regulation or taxation or nudges here and there to maybe try and make people want to eat less meat, maybe. And that's a good thing if we can do that. But we cannot expect to succeed in making people stop eating meat altogether, even though that would be great for the climate fight and great for the animal suffering that's now going on in, in, in factories and stuff like that. But there's simply no mechanisms to do that. How about so, lab-grown meat? I will be one of the first customers. <laughs> but I know that the 7 billion other people won't be because it's going to be expensive, mm-hmm. at least first. I hope Unless that you can 3D get... print it at home. I'm actually a bit more excited about this plant-based proteins that, for example, in Finland, we have had this Actually, this year, a couple of products that have come out there are pretty great. From my perspective, the lab-grown meat, I think right now in its current state, the amount of energy needed to make lab-grown meat work is way out of proportion from what you get, right? Because in comparison, you're talking about animals that have evolved to be able to maximize every single photon that crashes into grass, and they can then convert that grass into animal protein. So I think it's a pretty far way off. We're going to need some advanced nuclear reactors for that. You're going to need a lot cheaper (laughs) energy, that is for sure. Here's an idea, though. You could actually, you could have like a normal animal that you've genetically modified to the state where it doesn't have its own brain. Its brain is actually a computer that's fed from a central location, and you just have a load of growing meat sap. How about that? (laughs) I think we're way out of my pay grade. (laughs) There's no consciousness. So all you've got there is some, um, some zero moral impact living organisms 
how does that differ from actually lab meat in a petri dish if it doesn't have a nervous kind of a brain? Uh, Kutch, you're the one you might know here. Yeah. What's the difference between lab raw meat and yeah, it just uh, the animal, but with a with a centralized brain without actually a biological brain? You've got a centralized brain. One note, one quick note. It's a bad idea to tell most people that I'm gonna take this cow and I'm gonna remove its brain and then we can eat it <laughs> with good conscience. I I think it's yeah. At it's least not... it doesn't it doesn't work even for me and I I I'm a meat eater. Oh. It's not quite what I meant. I didn't mean like <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 but that's but that that's, that's how it will be heard and seen. Yeah, that's true. In their mind's eye. So you need mm. another strategy with that one. Damn. Back to the drawing <laughs> course. There's also um, I can't <laughs> remember the guy's funny. name, but it's a Dutch scientist who's trying to promote the idea of us uh, looking towards insects as a our social protein. It has a smaller carbon imprint, doesn't it? Yeah, as long as they make them into something that doesn't resemble insects. <laughs> At least at first, Crunchy. I'm I'm, go- I'm gonna be the second customer. I've already they tried it. So. <laughs> they grind them up into a paste, don't they? So you can actually have like a paste that you can put on yeah. bread and that kind of stuff. It's almost like a peanut yeah. butter. Yeah. Well, I've had that uh, sounds somehow less appealing. Yeah, I've had <laughs> I've had fried locusts, and it was just very like really really crunchy shrimp, but without the kind of shrimp taste, if you can understand that. You get some sort of eco activists coming along and releasing them into the wild, like uh, like they do with mink. <laughs> And you'd have swarms of locusts destroying all the crops in the UK as a result. You can GM some crops that can kill the locusts and stuff like that. Oh, okay. that's a good idea. <laughs> Eco-modernism is the thing that on Twitter seems to bring together people that are really interested from all these different areas. And actually, I met a guy, he goes by Hoff's Beef, H-O-F-F-S, B-E-E-F that really challenged a lot of my thinking. He's a geneticist that works on, uh, I think, cattle in particular. But he's the one that really got me thinking about what can you do with breeding of animals to lower their carbon footprint? What what can you do with the way that we manage uh, livestock to make the biggest difference to be able to intensify in the smallest amount of area to preserve the most? And I think just all the way back to the subject of the podcast, just using that word eco-modernism on Twitter ends up bringing you in contact with some really interesting people that you might not meet otherwise. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Rowley, how do you think the movement is the eco-modernism movement? Is it growing, do you think? Is it definitely attracting some a lot of new people? I think the most positive thing about it is that it's actually drawing new people into en- en- environmentalism. Like Vance yeah. said, you get in- interesting people, you get totally new people that care about nature, care about the environment, but doesn't want to subscribe to the whole package that comes with traditional environmentalism, that you have to kind of approve to all the idol- ideology or you're not part of the you know group. It's, it's important for everybody to be able to belong to a group and stuff like that. And uh, for example, here in Finland, we have right wing, left wing, centrist, practically communists, every aspect of the political system. We have Greens. We have greens in our founding fathers. We have greens in our board. Our current, uh, actually, our current chairman is a member of the Green Party, but he's also a nuclear researcher. So there's a lot of different people, and all of them care about the environment, at least in some ways, but not necessarily in every way that every other person does. And the, the it's actually a big active thing that we try to do is to promote the idea that we don't have to agree on everything and we should not pick fights about stuff that we disagree with, with each other or with the traditional environmentalists. When I talk with environmentalists, 99% about stuff, I agree with them. So why should I spend my time and energy and his time and energy fighting about the 1%? should be promoting the 99% that we actually agree on. Not forgetting that we disagree on stuff. Of course, we need to discuss that as well. In the pub with a couple of Yeah, yeah, that's the most efficient. I actually just invited the other day one of the head of Greenpeace Finland for a for a beer so we could talk about how the nuclear power in, in the United States is in trouble and how that's bad for climate. You know, from my perspective, environmentalism, if you bring that up with most uh, farmers, at least in the U.S., oftentimes they feel like people use environmental causes to get control over their land. So oftentimes environmentalism is something they stay really far away from. And I found over the last two years, or really about a year and a half, when I've gone out and brought up eco-modernism, 
to farmers, it's one that they're like, finally, this is something that celebrates us for doing what we know has been really good for our land, preserving the soil, not allowing erosion to happen um, because we aren't tilling as much or we aren't making as many passes with pesticides over the fields. So for many, many farmers in the U.S., eco-modernism is a way for them to be able to celebrate the environment because they want to preserve it as much as as much of it as possible as well at, by really stripping out a lot of the moralism um, and kind of I think uh, some of the, the things that had come along with environmentalism over the last 30 years. I kind of want to address the focus on optimism in eco-modernism. Is it new to this movement or is there an example of, an, of other environmental movements in the past that have had a focus on optimism instead of pessimism? Because I know the, the environmental movement has been dominated since the 1970s with the idea of limits to growth and the claim that human population and economic expansion will outstrip human capacity to grow food or uh, acquire the material resources we need to flourish in any kind of foreseeable future. Is there any evidence for these dire predictions? Yeah, sure, there is. I sometimes argue with my fellow eco-modernists about this, that they sort of don't like the idea of the limit growth people or the de degrowth people or, or stuff like that. But there is actually a lot of evidence. The fact that we had this book that was written, the, the Limits to Growth, that started the whole thing, and it used a pretty limited modeling system and computer to foresee things and stuff like that. And uh, then people take out some of the arguments in that book and they build a straw man and destroy it and say that, they, no, there will be no limits to growth because this was false. But that's as bad as argument as the other ones I, I mentioned earlier. So we need to look at the evidence also on that. Uh, but we need to look at it, not searching for the answer that we think we want or want to find or whatever. We need to look at the whole thing. And to put it shortly, we, we, we have this, that we have agreed that every time the Finnish Ecumenian Society has to review its stance on something, some environmental question, we will pop a champagne bottle and drink it. Because it's a good thing and we have learned something new and we have found new evidence. Because normally people are, they don't like that causes cognitive dissonance. It doesn't feel good to change your mind about something. But when you get champagne, when you do it, it's not that bad idea anymore. <laughs> yeah, there was uh, something Vance I wanted to lead on. And that is, uh, especially in your area, this is the one voice that always I feel is left out is that of the farmers themselves. Like in the whole debate over the, like you know the heavy the well conventional agriculture, but the farmers themselves, how do they feel about? It? Are they do they feel quite worn down that people always just seem to leave them out of the equation? Well, I think that for a long time farmers kind of kept themselves out of it, right? With every time farming gets more efficient, less and less people were needed, and those people that were not as good at it or didn't like it as much or just weren't in the right financial situation to stay there, they went into the city. And we've watched the largest migration in human history happen in the last 40 years where we went from uh, or the last 100 years where we went from over 40 percent of the population on farms to less than 2 percent. And then that 2 percent really was pretty happy to be out on the farm and not be in there talking with the general public. And I think now when I go out and talk with ag groups, they have realized, hey, wait a second, if the only person going out and talking to the public is the type of farmer that can also show up at farmer's markets and is trying to show why their crops are you should pay more for, whether that's because they're locally grown or they're grown using organic marketing standards, then a whole swath of the farming community is not being represented at all. The ones that are selling their tomatoes and their peppers and their cucumbers or corn or soy to commodity markets or to large scale grocers uh, where the, the farmer is not seen. So now farmers have, I think, said it, it's my fault, even though I don't want to get out there. I want to be farming. I, I know that if I don't get out and talk to the public, I'm going to have some real challenges. And I think when I, it comes to eco modernism, it's been a really powerful tool. So I get invited to go to agriculture schools and talk with um, sometimes the ag school will invite me in and then invite the entire campus in to talk. And a lot of times what I'll say is, if there's an environmental movement on your campus, don't show up and just go argue with them. Show up with something new that you guys can sit down and say, do we agree with this? 
which is what the Eco-Modernist Manifesto gives them. It gives them a document that they can show up and say, hey, can we sit down instead of being sitting across the table from one another? Why don't we sit side by side and go through this and see what do we agree with? What do we think is the, the right way forward? And you really can see that these ag kids who are not necessarily predisposed to wanting to fight, it gives them a way to cooperate and, and a way to connect with people in a way that they maybe didn't have before April of 2015. Agreed. Yeah, because there is a bit of that, like um, I'm studying mechanical engineering right now and engineers, we do just tend to shut ourselves off from the world. We're not that good at engaging. And like that relates into the nuclear power thing because I did an internship with someone. I met some former nuclear engineers and they admit that to say, well, do, they don't know how to speak to people about these things. I said to them, it's, yeah, to them, they just say, well, nuclear power makes sense to us, but to, <coughs> they can't say, but we're sitting there kind of, doing our equations and systems modeling, you know, dealing with the public isn't really something that comes up for them a lot. Yeah. It's the same thing in data analytics. We are just basically shut-ins. We know each other and then that's about it. And the same with our IT department. Our IT department, you don't even see them most of the time, yeah. apart from at the piss-ups where they're all hogging the pool table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose that's where it's different in Czech as we're in uh, Ireland. We're trying to actively promote our research but it's mostly through uh, newsletters that pharmacists can subscribe to so we're actively targeting kind of to re our research bases towards the agricultural sectors and farms would be the main thing but we also put it up online for general public but we're trying to get that a bit more often because that's a question with you kids because your research right now is uh, involving animals based well cows so i mean do you get any what kind of reaction do you get in the public from that I mean, do people say, oh, you're working on animals and they suddenly see you twirling your moustache with a monocle? Or... <laughs> Not yet. I wish. Because <laughs> I want to invest in those things. <laughs> well, it, it's really, when I explain my research, it, it's more for the benefit of cows because it's for mastitis, which is not fun for cows to get. They don't really like infections in their memory glands. So... It's not seen as evil mustache twirling. I'm killing the rats or I'm killing the cows for the fun of it, mm. uh, even though no, no cows have been have died um, yeah. yet. There's a lot of nervous laughter there, Kitch. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't really approached the cows, so I'm really hoping that no harmful negative reactions occurs. <laughs> so we have done some some work before, so it should be all right. But we're infusing probiotics into the into the mammary gland and hoping that reaction occurs uh, that clears out everything including the pathogen which is usually staphylococcus aureus but usually i get a mixture of what and sometimes yeah that sounds good because it's probiotics and pro and, and you know everybody loves their probiotics yeah uh, so you're injecting yuckle into their tits basically <laughs> uh, yeah Kind of a, a probiotic I design. Well, I didn't design, but oh, I see. Yeah, it's a different bacteria. Yeah, it's cool. be, is it one that you would drink yourself? Is it is it that kind of a strand of of strain of probiotic? Yeah. If strain is the right word, I don't know. Or is it something that is purely to actually help out their disease, their illness? Well, uh, the the probiotic itself is just one strain of bacteria, which I know most probiotics are usually a mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one we use is called Lactococcus lactis, which is the strain found or isolated in our research center in Chagas. It's called DPC 3147. Anyway, now myself, I wouldn't drink probiotics because although I do, I, I, sometimes I do like the natural, uh, what do we call them? The probiotic yogurts. Not for any health kind of reasons or anything. They're just tasty. <laughs> They're just very, 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 very delicious because those kind of probiotics... They don't usually have the high levels of bacteria they claim, and sometimes species that are listed are missing. And your gut microbiota is usually so stable that these bacteria don't last long. They'll be gone in a day or two. So if there's any effect, you have to keep on actively eating. And I don't think there's an, I think it's a negligible effect, really, if anything. The only reason you would take our advised probiotics is if you have something where your gut microbiota is disturbed, like um, after antibiotic associated diarrhea. That's something probiotics may be good for, but more research is needed. More funding for me. <laughs> yeah. 
But yeah, like you say, you don't really get a strong reaction that, oh, you're working on animals. Um, maybe Just... at the start, or once I explained that it's basically we're used for taking sick cows and trying this new medicine yeah. on them. So it's not like we're going in and actively making them sick. No, we're taking the cows that are already sick and trying out this new probiotic. So yeah, it is sort of like a similar method to how Vance engages people. You just ex- you say, well, what is it that you don't like about glyphosate? Well, this is what we're doing with glyphosate. This is why we're doing it. This is a big part of eco-modernism as well, isn't it? Not just uh, promoting and educating the science behind uh, the movement, but also trying to connect it to the values that are yeah. pretty much universally held among people. Even the people who want to go back to nature, there's something in it for them too, because eco-modernism is concerned with preserving nature, even as we remove our impact from it and live independently of it. I once had a chance to uh, chat with Mike Schellenberger, one of the founders of the Breakthrough Institute and the author of the, or one of the authors of the Eco-Modernist Manifesto. <laughs> and he said something that I thought was really profound and it actually really helps frame up how I communicate with people. He said, no one will care about what you know until they know what you care about. And, and really it's about like, what values do you have? And if they see that you have the same values, then they're far, far more <laughs> open to understanding, okay, what deep knowledge do you have about things? And I think that's, to your point, what eco-modernism brings to this whole discussion is, is a lot about yeah. values. Does that mean that you have to tailor your values to your potential audience or as entail your open values, the values that you actually share with people to your open audience? Or <laughs> is it just something that is, is a part of yourself naturally? Is it something that you don't particularly have to work on? Is it just the reason that you do your job anyway? Does that make sense? I mean, one of the things that we found with farmers is they were never, when they were getting up and talking with the broader public, they just assumed that everybody realized, hey, the water that I am drinking comes from wells that are fed by rainwater that comes from my field. So I am so comfortable with the things that we're using on our fields that I'm drinking that water. Not only that, but I love and care for my family and I would only feed them or give them things to drink that I think are safe. And although it sh- maybe they shouldn't have to say these things, you watch when a farmer is talking, when they connect, I love and care for my family. I care about what they eat and what they drink. Then suddenly that changes the way that people view that farmer. And so it's really been surprising to me that you do need to articulate it because if somebody hasn't doesn't realize like the your shared humanity, um, sometimes you have to point it out to them, even in subtle ways. Oh, very much so. I think the one thing that a lot of businesses are doing these days is a is a color system, a color systems of personalities, and I think it kind of ties into that as well. There's a lot of things that we don't realize that people understand about us, and there's a lot of things that we keep inside which we think are self evident which we then don't express to other people in a way that they will be able yeah. to grasp. So sometimes it's good to be able to have that kind of reflective, and not just reflective, but also a, a conversation with other people to try and find out whether your personality and your values are coming across to others in the way that you would hope they are. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I don't I have no idea if I'm doing that. but. <laughs> I mean, you talked about one of the values that you do share, right? Like you love so much challenging new ideas that you break open a bottle of champagne. That's something that other people can celebrate in a way that I think most people don't expect. Yeah, yeah. And it's a good good reason to have champagne available at all times. <laughs> <laughs> Just our um, champagne is a fridge full of it, yeah, isn't it? I have a um, uh, train of thought about that values and nuclear power. Yes, in Finland, bioenergy is a big thing, like I said before. And of course, some people are also complaining that while we build new nuclear reactors, we are cutting down some forests, make space. When you actually do the math, don't tell the people the math, just tell the, the, the result, is that with one reactor, you can produce as much electricity as you would produce from the area of forest growth of some three to four million hectares. So that's that's the amount of forest that you can leave the fuck alone if you build one reactor. I mean, it's it's a big amount of forest. Mm. Yeah. Whereas it's, with wind turbines, for example, you have to potentially clear masses and masses of land to be able to install them. Although we've got the offshore ones at the moment as well. 
Uh, what do you think um, is actually the biggest downside to things like wind farms and solar power? Is it simply that they can't produce enough electricity to be able to feed the growing demand? Or are there other factors that you think? Um, I mean, there's, there is, of course, a big carbon footprint involved in creating those uh, wind farms and creating those solar panels, etc. as well. It's not it? that big. Is it not? No, it's comparable to nuclear with wind farms and uh, okay. uh, a little bit more with solar PV panels. Yeah, it depends a lot where they are made. Of course, China has pretty dirty energy grid. So Chinese panels are not as clean as ones made in Finland because <laughs> uh, cleaner energy. But what was the original question? Oh, sorry. It was just what, what do you think are the biggest things against um, wind power and solar energy being? Oh, OK. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's actually, well, the footprint is one, but I think the biggest, biggest problem is the intermittency that they are not able as themselves, they are not able to meet the demand of modern society because they are not dispatchable. So you would have to figure out how to store immense amounts of energy. We have some ways, but mainly we have pumped hydropower. That's like 98% of the storage capacity that we now have globally. Mm -hmm. So, and then there is batteries and stuff like that are like half a percent or, or something like that. So the intermittency is, is the biggest problem and it will get worse the more we get uh, the, the big, bigger share of, for example, wind and solar, which are both intermittent. The, 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 the bigger share we have in the grid, those sources, the, the, the worse this problem will be. So we might be able to come up with solutions. We have demand, flexibility, and storage, and stuff like that, and, and uh, smart grids and electronic vehicles and whatever. But we really need to develop them at least at the same pace as we build more wind power or solar PVs. Because otherwise, it, to put it nicely, it's going to fuck up the electricity market and, and how it works. Yeah. Mm. So that's the, yeah, that's the main problem. All right. I was just saying that can sink nicely into the... Uh, we got a few questions on Twitter. Uh, I think I'll read this one's from Val Bays. I think I can see Vance grinning right now hearing that. <laughs> uh it's actually it's a two-tiered question, but it's quite good. Um, we, she'd like to know if those involved in eco-modernism, have you tried to connect with the less pragmatic environmentalists, such as going to summits, conferences, panels, in some way to make the two groups connect? I think uh, Vance and Riley can both take a stab at that. So, I mean, I know that the Breakthrough Institute that put forward the Eco-Modernist Manifesto has what they call the Breakthrough Dialogues. I think it's in the spring. And the number of people that they bring to this is pretty wide and far reaching. People like Julie <laughs> Kelly, who was teaching cooking classes in her suburban Chicago home, and uh, Amy Porterfield Levy, who was a stay at home mom in Florida, were really grabbed on to things like eco modernism and came out to those breakthrough dialogues. And then they have Allison Van Eneman and Pamela Ronald, scientists at the, in the UC the University of California system, like, so they're bringing together pretty diverse groups. That being said, I've also heard Alex <clears throat> Trembeth, who's one of the fellows at the Breakthrough Institute say, we don't spend a lot of time trying to convince people that are on the far opposite end of the spectrum. We find that there's a lot more good work to be done with people that are maybe neutral or already kind of positive, but not with certain groups. And I think in that particular instance, he called out Greenpeace. And so I think that they're doing a good job of trying to bring in kind of that middle group, but don't spend too much time on the opposite ends. Although, you know, you are, uh, Raul, so getting together with the head of uh -huh. Greenpeace. Yeah, I'm, I'm always in for a beer with anyone. <laughs> uh, I actually was uh, also at the Breakthrough Dialogue this summer. So, yeah, it was great. And so Julie and, and uh, Amy there as well. But I see that point because if somebody is completely on the other side of something, it's often useless to try, especially if you do it on Twitter, which is <laughs> horrible for explaining the nuances about stuff that sometimes need to be explained. That's why I go for the beer. Twitter is great for writing, why don't we go get a beer about this? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the limit. But yeah, here in Finland, we've tried and succeeded a lot in having a dialogue also with other environmentalist groups. But from what I've seen around the world while I'm following the, the debates, 
on Twitter and, and Facebook and wherever. I think we have the best greens of the world in Finland as far as this kind of stuff, openness to science and technology and ideas and this goes. So maybe it's easy for us in Finland. Of, of course, it's a small country and everybody knows everybody and everybody is almost a relative of everybody else. <laughs> no, but you know, five, <laughs> only five million people here. So it's easier for us to get along, I think. In the environmental scene, everybody knows everybody. So it's easy to invite, to, to go speak at another party's event or go get a beer with them. But it is often pointless to argue with people who are totally on the different side of something because there is no communication. You just talk and the talk goes past the other one and he talks back at you and it goes past you and uh, nobody's getting anything. So why waste energy? But That's then, why you need to try to find something in common. Yeah, but then mm. I have heard that some people say, well, it's not benefiting either of you. There might be people on the sidelines who might just get that seed in their mind that's, from watching yeah, it. That's basically the only reason that I do some of that. But yeah. that's then I'm talking with the people who are on the sideline, not not the, All right. not, the not the other one. Basically. Not the flat earthers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I, I have heard some people say that that arguing with people who are directly opposite, well, you've got no chance of changing their mind. It might be someone in their audience just yes. like, oh, what's that? Mm. What, what did that guy say there? Yeah. And I need to know more about yeah, it. Definitely. It might just start them on that path. When you do it like that, your own argumentation changes a lot from what you would have if you are arguing with the person. Because now you are arguing for the audience. Yeah. Mm. I said, have you heard anything back from Greenpeace about the eco-modernism? Have they said anything about this? I talked with one of the lead guys. We were actually on television uh, talking about nuclear and climate when my latest book came out in, in Finland this summer. And um, we chatted. I knew the guy before. And after after the show, we had a chat in the other room. And he told me that I'm really glad that you guys, as eco-modernists and environmentalists, have come out, especially as environmentalists who are pro-nuclear because before for the last 20 years 30 years the other side that we have been uh, talking with about these things is basically middle-aged white males who run a corporation and they don't necessarily give a fuck about the environment and if they do they don't say it in public so for him it was refreshing to talk about this subject with another environmentalist because that was the first one for him and that i, I think that's a big thing that eco-modernism can, can have on the discussion and the debate is that we bring the environmental case for these things, GMOs, for, for nuclear power, and not just, ah, uh, we need electricity, so let's b- build a nuclear plant. Fuck the people. <laughs> We're not those guys. The Monty guys, Burns. Guys, yeah, the guys with the money and the big car and security guys. So there's a huge amount of misunderstanding in regards to anybody who talks about gmo talks about nuclear etc that it is all about money that it is all about profit and the margins over actually looking after the planet there is this sort of conspiracy idea that people are either after money or they are shilling because they're being paid money and that is something that i find incredibly difficult to overcome any single time that i talk about it you just get a, a sideways glance and a, oh yeah that's great i mean nuclear power companies are only in it for the money and I think we did touch on it earlier on, but is that something that you find as well, Rolly? Do you, do you find that you get a lot of people who are immediately dismissive of what you're talking about when you're talking about nuclear energy? Or, or is that literally, am I just speaking to the fringe sort of far opposite people when um, when I get that reaction? I, yeah, I get those people. Some people ask politely if I work for the industry and then I explain how I live. <laughs> Basically, uh, some people don't believe some people get offensive about it, you know, giving names and stuff like that. You get all kinds of people. Uh, some people, when I tell you that I, actually I'm a freelance writer and I, uh, I write for various publications. Okay, one of them includes a nuclear company's publication right now. I write for them about nuclear because that's what I know how to do. And they pay for me. I wouldn't do it for free for them. Mm. Shill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm only messing. I'm only messing. But people will probably <laughs> shout that at you all the time, don't they? Shill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I get yeah. that too because I've got friends yeah. at NASA, and every single time I was, I've got a friend who works at SLS, they go, Shill. 
But also, yeah, Jen, that. you're the one with a all C9 behind you right now as well. Yeah. That be... I got that specifically to trigger conspiracy theorists, and it works every time. It's fantastic. <laughs> you need to have it set up so it blinks as well. That would be really That's cool. a fantastic what, idea. Uh, I like that. What about like Wands? What about Wands? You work for Monsanto. Yeah, I mean, in my the case, I, mean, and I, I truly well, am a show, right? <laughs> like, I am paid to go out and talk about modern ag. And I think a couple of the things that I end up doing is is leaning into it by saying, uh, the, if anyone is ever standing up in front of you uh, to talk about why they believe something is good or something works, all you should be using a speaker for is to say, I want to go check out that thing that he said. I want to go check out this idea or this way of thinking, maybe it can crack open some ideas that I had before. But I'm always very quick to say, don't believe what I'm saying just because yeah. I've said it, go check mm -hmm. it. But then the other side of it is before I came to Monsanto, I was in the US Peace Corps. I was a deckhand on an ecotourism ship. I worked in public radio for PBS. I had a chance to go in any direction that I wanted. And I found that by coming to work at Monsanto, by coming to work on this problem, how do you communicate the value of biotechnology to a public that's been made to feel afraid? This is the biggest way that I've ever found to make a difference in the world. I could have made money doing many other things. The reason I'm here is because this is the biggest way that I get to make a difference in the world. And I think whether or not people fully accept it, they at least can say, all right, well, you know, it is a different perspective than we hear from most of the time. So I, I guess I try and lean into it and just accept that people may not believe me based on who I am or, or who writes my paychecks. But at least if I'm saying interesting things, I'm trying to create that cognitive dissonance that makes them go look things up. Yeah, because bizarrely enough, our show's gotten that for hosting you. You probably, in the lead up to that show, you, I think you're quite aware of some of the, the comments and responses we got just for hosting you. And we were being accused of what. And the main thing they said was, do you really expect Vance to tell the truth? And I said, well... I expect him to believe what he is saying is true and that he's going to be sincere. And then he just asks, why do you expect him to be sincere? Well, because he's a human being and that's how interactions <laughs> work. But yeah, we've had to deal with quite a lot of that just because we've had you on, you've said your piece and we had Fred on and we had Rowley on to speak about nuclear. And and that's within the skeptic community as well. So there's <laughs> still lots of work. I, I, go ahead, Vance. Well, I was going to say for a long time, at least modern ag, but I think probably nuclear, probably many industries, what we were saying before, they're not comfortable with going out and talking. So the fact that they were removed from the conversation, not participating, played into the idea that they shouldn't be participating, right? So it's better if these people are not called to account or not brought on and interviewed. But now people are seeing like, hey, it's important to get on podcasts of people that are truly trying to find out what's the right answer. This is the most valuable place to be because the people that are listening to this podcast, they just want to know the right answer, right? You can't go out and put a commercial and find the type of people that are listening to podcasts because commercials are, are going to just roll right off of them. So all you can do is make yourself available and try and answer questions. And so that's why I always try and go out and find who's going to ask me the toughest question because that's where we will actually get things done. Because I think a lot of this drive towards more of the professionals coming, I think it stems back to with BP, how they handled their crisis. And I think a lot of companies now have looked at that and said, that's when public engagement was so vital. And the guy, you know, the head of BP, he didn't do a very good job. I mean, he was being sincere, and but he just didn't communicate it very well at all. And so, and I think that's what's driven a lot of companies. Probably, I don't know if it had an effect. Were you employed at the time for that, Vance? Well, I was employed, just not with Monsanto. But, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I mean, with Monsanto. <laughs> well, so, I mean, we came down to the fact that for a long time, our company said, hey, the argument is so hot that it feels dangerous for, the, for we as a company to put our people out there. And eventually it came down to our people are coming to the board of directors, they're coming to the executives and they're saying, can we please get out there? And And Monsanto is now really proud of saying, we don't tell anybody what to say on their social media. All we've done is say, you can now start taking photos inside your lab. You can talk with people. Tell people you're from Monsanto, but go out and say whatever it is you think it's important to say. And I think that that we're one of the first companies to do this, but I don't think we'll be the last. I think we'll find a lot of companies that are finding themselves embattled to be saying, 
We're going to let our people go out and talk, not just the talking heads, not just the yeah. the communications of the executives, but all the people throughout the company. And do you think, yes, I don't know if you can answer, but do you think the BP thing kind of kickstarted a lot of that? Because I'm seeing more corporations going along that line. Definitely. I mean, I think that that many companies took a look at how information and news spread and how if you aren't on top of looking at the new media, you're going to get left behind. And yeah. I, I, so it definitely had an impact. On that point, there was a fantastic video that I saw not too long ago uh, talking about what is a GMO. So that was one that came out of Monsanto and they were talking, they were going into the lab and they had a little bit of a joke about it. And they were saying uh, a GMO is this is how we make a GMO. This is how it's created. It isn't sort of lots of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type people in a lab trying to create sort of some mutant, completely different looking product. And that, I suppose, would belay the fears of a few people who are science interested in science literate. But how do you overcome the the innate distrust of something that is called genetically modified? This entire term modified has people thinking that it is something different to what it was originally, as in genetically modified corn it is intrinsically itself a different type of crop, although it isn't, is it? I mean, it, it is still the same. It is still a cereal crop. It is still, in effect, corn. And over in the UK, of course, we've had all this uh, legislation going through or attempting to go through recently saying you shouldn't need to label it GMO, which I think in the United States is the same. Forgive me if I'm incorrect. You shouldn't need to label it because it is essentially the same thing or that that's the argument. I mean, this is a, this is a great question because actually I think it's informative for a lot of people. When that term first came out, GMO, genetically modified organism, very few people in the science industry, whether that was in academia or in actual industry, used that term. They said that is not a descriptive term. It's not accurate. Why would we use that term? We're doing transgenics. It's far more sophisticated than that. We shouldn't use that term. So they made it a point of in none of your brochures and none of your public facing information, use that term GMO. But the activists were using it and they were flooding those memes with ideas like syringes in tomatoes or corn that has fangs on it. So because the science community was not using the term that the public was starting to come up with, then then the public was able to become afraid of a term that really was about moving just one or two or three genes in. And I think we will never see that happen again. I think that much of industry has learned from that. So things like CRISPR, Cas9 technology, gene editing. I think we're going to watch people be much more responsive to what are the words that the public are using so that that way we make sure that science is being the thing that's being embedded into those memes rather than just fear. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, also, another thing around fear, um, which probably Rowley and um, Vance, you can both answer on this. To do with failure, to do with something actually goes wrong with a project, such as I think one of the big ones that I don't know enough about it, but it was a Monsanto um, <clears throat> thing in India, where there's this whole thing about farmer suicides and crop failures, etc. I think it was cotton um, and also nuclear going back to Fukushima, etc. How can we best deal with failures and actually improve the trust of the public in regards to new technologies after something like that happens? Well, I'll take the first one. I mean, the farmer suicide myth was one that I think our biggest feeling was that we didn't respond to it. We thought, hey, the data is clearly on our side that it, the introduction of GMO cotton actually started um, helping a lot of farmers out and that the suicides that were going on were much more about culture and other financial difficulties that were going on in the country. But our big failing there was not recognizing that, that it was a real problem. But if I were to take a step back and say, you know, what are the larger challenges that a company, if there was a failing, what could they do? And I, I think it is get out in front of it and be talking and saying, this is why we tried what we were trying. And this was the result of it. But absent getting out and communicating with the public, they're going to be left to be as afraid of things as people that want them to be afraid of it uh, will let them. And I think that maybe all of this activism and all of the fear mongering around GMOs, the best thing to come out of it is I think all industries are being forced to become far more transparent. And instead of just having a few people in any one given company being able to talk, you're really opening up the doors so that a guy like me can be on a podcast like yours without supervision with, you know, just saying, hey, go out there and talk about what you know. We trust that you're going to get out and um, and communicate openly and, and honestly on our behalf. That's great. Cal, you've got one final question from our old friend Ziller to read out, don't you? Yeah, uh, this is directed to you, Vance. 
how is it acceptable that the foods uh, using Monsanto GM crops have genetically altered me so that I now have gills on my buttocks? <laughs> I think you should probably see a doctor, and that probably has not, not much to do with us. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, wrap this one up now. We'll get our final thoughts from our two guests, uh, whichever one of you wants to go first. Final thoughts about eco-modernism and how it relates to everything, br bring it all together to everything we've talked about. Well, yeah, this is a hard, hard one to wrap up, really. I mean, for me, the most important thing about it is that it's evidence-based and we can change our minds. And we're constantly watching out that there's no ideologies that start to grow and we make up our mind on something finally and completely. It's a bit like, well, scientific environmentalism. It is always room for change, for reviewing your thoughts about something and your views. On the other hand, I completely agree with what Vance has been saying, that people need to be able to go out there and interact with other people and talk about stuff and do eco-modernism, even though they don't have the complete knowledge of the world in their brain. So it's going to get messy, but messy solutions for messy problems, that's how things actually get done. We need to bring more this kind of thinking to politics, decision-making, and for example, the European level which is which has been very embarrassing on many of these subjects lately yeah that's about it i think from my perspective it's a big honor to be able to talk about eco-modernism because it's like standing on the shoulder of giants i i did not create the idea i just was able to come across a bunch of people that were trying to say how can we make a big difference in the world well one of the ways we can do it is update this idea of what is environmentalism. And one of the authors for eco-modernism is a man named Stuart Brand. And he has this phrase that I, I really love, and I think it embodies eco-modernism, which is, this present moment was once the unimaginable future. And I feel like that is the environmental direction that eco-modernism is taking us in. It's saying, embrace this idea that we're doing so much better, we're doing so much more. And so I guess maybe just to close, it would be to say, go read the, the manifesto. It's only about 30 pages long, and it can be found at ecomodernism.org. And if you have questions about how that relates to Monsanto, um, we have a website, uh, discover.monsanto.com, that you can go ask questions about, or you can just ask me. I'm, I'm on Twitter, and I love the back and forth, particularly with skeptics that are interested enough to be listening to trolling with logic. So. <laughs> And we'll put links to both of your Twitter handles in the description, as well as a link to the Eco Modernist Manifesto and the Monsanto Question webpage you mentioned. And we want to thank our two guests very much for yeah. being with us today. And just to wrap up, uh, we want to mention again the Patreon account that Cal has set up for Trolling with Logic. That's at patreon.com slash trolling with logic. If you would like to support us, please do. If you can't, that's okay as well. The show will always be free. But we just want to let you know that that's out there now for people who want to support us. And with that, all that's left for me to say is goodbye and have a good rest of your weekend, uh, whatever's left of it anyway. Okay, bye, everyone. See bye, ya. everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. See you guys.